In her new work, The Thanksgiving Play, Larissa Fast Horse puts four well-intentioned and ill-equipped white people into a classroom. They're tasked with writing a more culturally sensitive play about Thanksgiving that they will stage for their elementary school students. The premise is genius, as is almost everything about this production. We watch these four characters make mistake after mistake after mistake as they try to find the right approach, plot, or words to form their play. We laugh and cringe at the progressively worse ideas each and every time. The play is satire, and if you see it as I did, you'll find yourself laughing hysterically and then questioning whether it was okay for you to laugh at all. But that's the point of satire. It's not there just to make us laugh, but also to make us think. Thanksgiving play is equally adept at doing both. After the play, it had me questioning the origins of Thanksgiving and my perspective on our early history as a country. It sent me Googling to learn more about the play and its playwright. In one interview, Fast Horse talks about how difficult it can be working with well-meaning liberal people in theater, saying, quote, they're so scared of making a mistake that it paralyzes them into doing nothing. She hopes the takeaway for her play is that we can all just make mistakes together, saying that at least gives us somewhere to go. As the characters in the play demonstrate, as they twist themselves in knots with almost everything they say, do, or think, fear of doing something wrong can often be what holds us back from doing anything right. When we make a mistake alone, we can be reprimanded, shamed, or punished. The primary lesson is not to learn from the mistake, but to avoid making a similar one at all costs. A mistake is defined as a wrong action or statement proceeding from faulty judgment, inadequate knowledge, or inattention. If we don't talk about our mistakes or even laugh at ourselves for making them, how are we to improve our judgment, increase our knowledge, and pay more close attention regarding the issues we care about? It can be hard for us as individuals, communities, or as a country to discuss our mistakes, particularly those that are most egregious and obvious, but it's essential we do so if we hope to grow. Which brings us back to the power of art and theater specifically. Creations like this spark dialogue and change, not because they elevate the idealistic or righteous, but because they lay bare the messy, even ridiculous mistakes that are often necessary to realize progress. I'm Bob McKinnon, and you're listening to Attribution, where people from all walks of life reflect on who and what has contributed to where they ended up. Our hope is after each episode, you feel more inspired, grateful, or supported than when you first hit play. Today I'm talking to the playwright Larissa Fast Horse. She's a 2020 MacArthur Fellow, award-winning writer and choreographer, and co-founder of Indigenous Direction, the nation's leading consulting company for indigenous arts and audiences. With her latest work, The Thanksgiving Play, she became the first Native American woman to have her play on Broadway. We talked about her journey and how we connect with our culture and with each other. I hope you enjoy. So first of all, congratulations on the new play. I saw it on Tuesday and it, it was wonderful. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I'd love to start because I was, I was, I was trying to learn a little bit more about you and trying to you know, get a, a clearer picture on how you ended up from South Dakota to Broadway and obviously a lot of stops in between. Um, and I wonder if you just talk a little bit about your journey growing up and, and how you got into the arts first in dance and then into theater and, and with a stop in film and TV uh, in, the, in the middle there. Yeah, um, you know, it was a, quite a journey. It's a long journey. <laughs> I've been writing many plays about. So <laughs> thanks. I started out in South Dakota on my reservation uh, in a border town just off of it. Um, I was adopted very young. And uh, my parents got me when I was 11 months old and open adoption to a white family. And eventually, Eventually, we ended up moving to Pierre, which I would say it sounds ridiculous when I'm telling people from the outside world, <laughs> but like we moved to the city. Um, it's 13,000 people, so that sounds really small in the regular world, but it's a town that wasn't a rural based economy. It's the state mm. capital, so it's not based on farming and ranching and kind of prides itself on its arts, actually. Mm. And so I grew up, you know, with parents that were very committed to the arts in their own way for them the way most of their expression of art was through their church through music they both played instruments they were organists for church they sang in choir my dad was also a painter and did just a very skilled gentleman in, in a lot of different crafts and things and my mother you know did a lot of crafts as well and so i think music and and art were always part of our life my dad was on the board of our little uh 
presenting organization that did uh, <laughs> capital concerts, you know, so we'd get things like the, you know, Idaho Ballet came in once and that was the most exciting thing in the world to me because I was studying to be a ballet dancer then I had never seen one. Mm. And Chinese acrobats would come through and small symphonies from Kansas and, you know, whatever. So yeah. we had that. And then we also had um, community theater and we had arts in the school always. And then we had community theater and all of my friends were involved in the community theater. And since I was not a theater person then, I ran the concession stand, which now I'm realizing was much more <laughs> valuable to me and what I do, right? Because I watched yeah. the same plays over and over and over right. again. Um, so I'd see one play, you know, 30 times, and I got to really kind of study how plays work doing that. So yeah, so all that was to say, uh, I had a life surprisingly surrounded by arts here in the middle of South Dakota. You know, I'd never seen a Broadway show. I'd never seen a, you know, I'd been, never been to New York or anything like that. But art was just kind of part of our lives. And I would say also, in, from the Lakota standpoint, it, art is woven into everything mm. we do. It's not considered something separate. It's considered just part of life. So all that practically for myself, I was put into ballet at a young age because, well, <laughs> late for a ballet dancer, I was eight, but young age to a normal person for physical therapy because I had problems with my legs and, um, I uh, was way behind. I love a challenge more than anything in the world. And I uh, not only caught up or surpassed my class in a couple of years and decided impossibly at the age of 10 that I was going to be a professional ballet dancer after seeing a picture of Maria Tallchief and mm-hmm. thinking, oh, well, that's me. You know, she's <laughs> half native and she's out in Oklahoma. And I didn't realize that her parents like moved her to California and bought her her own private ballet coaches. I, I didn't know any of that. <laughs> I just thought, oh, I can be that. Um, and so I just decided that's what I was going to be. And then I went through a long journey to get there. From ballet, I went into tired early, like everyone does, 29, mm. and started looking into what I was going to do next. And writing was something a career counselor helped me find through career, trans- career transitions for dancers. And I became a writer. And because I was in LA, I worked in film and TV first, made my own internship figured out my own little training path and became a writer there, was very frustrated with that and was commissioned to write my first play. And that's where I've been ever since. That's great. Yeah, I, I want to go back and dive into some of what you covered because there's such a, an interesting collection of fate and accident and things that were probably yeah. really inspiring and also really difficult. And you talked about being adopted. And mm-hmm. I spoke with um, Daryl McDaniels from Run DMC a while back, who talked about his adoption journey and how he sort of struggled with that for quite a long time. And I know you've written about meeting your your birth mom for the first time as an adult. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, there's such a sliding door aspect to that in terms of your life and the formative relationships that put you on your current path. I'm wondering how you make sense of that. Yeah, you know, I'm still figuring it out. I was fortunate I had, I had kind of all the experiences. <laughs> so I had an yeah. open adoption where my parents knew my birth father, the fast horse family for a long time before I came on the scene. And then though there was my birth mother who was gone when I was a baby. So I didn't meet her again until piece you referred to that I wrote about. Um, I didn't meet her until I was like 20, 21, mm-hmm. somewhere in there. And so, and she chose not to be a part of my life at all. And my parents had never even seen her. So it was kind of, ha- so I had like both, you know, mm, yeah, <laughs> I had the yeah. open adoption side. And then I also had the kind of a the equivalent of a closed adoption. So there was definitely interesting struggles in that, honestly, my birth mother, I didn't really think about. She just didn't exist. I'd never seen a picture. She, mm. my mother and I are very close. So I didn't really, I didn't have like a yearning for her in any way. Biological father... I did remember and know, and he continued to visit me for the first few years. And then because of his own life journey and struggles, you know, he was gone for most of my life. And so I did, that was one that I dealt with that was harder to deal with, that I'm still (laughs) figuring out in therapy and all the things. He just passed away recently, a couple of years ago. And um, he was a complicated individual. And and I'm so incredibly grateful, though, for all he gave me with Mm. knowing who my family was and that they would give me a good life and wanting me to be raised with them and for him doing the best he could as far as being in my life when he could and um and then not being my life for a long time but it's definitely a struggle and because that's the lakota side of me that caused a lot of shame in my early life i'm also very Mm. light-skinned not as light as my one biological brother but i I am quite light-skinned and so growing up in a place like south dakota where lakota people are everywhere you know you you cannot walk down the street without seeing a lakota person and our culture is everywhere and and our our land is obviously here 
it was something I was struggled with as a young person. And, and my parents really worked hard to make sure I had Lakota influences and culture and elders in my life. But, you know, I had a lot of internalized shame about not being part of my family. It took a lot of years, yeah. right? When you're a child, you feel like it's your fault. But it took a lot yeah, of years yeah. for me to say, like, well, it's not my fault. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was just a baby, you know, like what I do. You know, I didn't do a lot of the early ceremonies. I always wanted to be a powwow dancer, but I was a ballet dancer and I was yeah. in ballet school in the summers. And so I, I struggled with that for a lot of years and really had to find my own way I thought I had to find my own way back to my culture, yeah. but it was really interesting. I had a, when I was probably, I'd say mid twenties, I was back here in South Dakota visiting my folks in Pierre and my dad said, oh, you know, there are these women in this class. He taught at the community college and he said, you know, he had lots of Lakota women always in his classes because there's a nursing school attached to the college. And he said, you know, there's these ladies that want to get together with you and talk to you about what your work and what you're doing. And so I went out to this dinner with them and at one of their homes and um, I was really nervous because I was still in a place of feeling like I didn't belong in some way and I wasn't Lakota enough and all those things. But I was working on my cultural basis for myself and I got there and this woman said, oh, you know, I remember you when you were a baby. I, I took care of you mm -hmm. before you're adopted. And then I remembered seeing you driving around town with your parents and I was so happy for the three of you. And another woman was like, oh, yeah, I know, you know, I knew your whole family and I remembered you when you were your adoption and all these things. And I talked about it and um, I got really emotional and they said, we're singing welcome song to you, not to welcome you back because you've always been here. We've yeah. always known you. You've always been one of us. We're just singing a welcome song to say, yay, welcome to my home in yeah. this particular circle. But we've always been there with you. And that was a big turning point for me. Yeah, I mean, that's such a wonderful story. And, and I was asking about that stuff because the stories we tell about ourselves and the way we make sense of our own life seems to be so foundational to the stories that we tell others. Yeah. And I only asked you about the adoption and birth mom because it's something, you know, I think a lot of people can relate to, including myself, mm -hmm. where you do, you wonder about these things like, is, is something my fault when, of course, it can't be as a child? And that's a common sort of a uh, way in which we first make sense of things. And And, and I had a not dissimilar experience where I did not know my birth dad very well at all. And I was told one story about why he wasn't in my life and that sort of made sense to me. And then I later learned that that mm. was not the case. And so mm. I grew up thinking there was this person out here out there that was looking for me and only discovered as an adult that uh, he, that was not the case at all. And in fact, did not tell his other family that I had even existed. And so I always thought about what it would be like to have the conversation that you had when you are out there and asking someone else to try to make sense of their decision and and for lack of a better term, sort of let you off the hook a little bit for mm -hmm. maybe the way in which you were feeling or to make sense in that way. Yeah. And I will say too, you know, um, to, I mean, just between us, between yeah. you and me here, <laughs> um, <laughs> I will say, you know, it's, it's interesting also to have to come to an understanding with my birth parents that, you know, they both had their own issues they went on and had yeah. you know other lives and things that I was never going to get the answers I wanted mm. even talking to them directly time and memory are very tricky things and yeah. and the way they've written themselves into their own story and their own guilt and their own things right yeah so yeah. like the stories from each of them were so incredibly different from that time that I was like you know what that I just have to let go of that and yeah. just you know live my story that's all I can do yeah, years ago, I, uh, my brother and sister and I, we grew up in Boston and lived in difficult circumstances with a lot of things that come with poverty and whatnot. She was a single mom, as a bartender, re raising the three of us. And we went back together many years later and we were joking. We'll talk about humor later in your new play, but we were joking about sort of like what it was like to eat spam for dinner frequently or do this or blah, blah, blah. And my mom just broke down and she started, she got mm -hmm. upset and she started crying and she stood up, she goes, I was 25 and I was with three kids on my own. I was doing the best I could. And I mm -hmm. felt so awful, but it also made me, again, sometimes you don't think about the adults in your life as being barely adults or dealing with yeah. a lot of issues, you know? And so it's a, it's, it's a, one of those things where you just makes you sort of give you a pause and a newfound appreciation for discovery, you know, about different aspects of mm -hmm. your life. Yeah. On, a on a slightly lighter note, I was going to ask you, <laughs> I saw that the town that you did grow up in or live in for a while was called Winter. Is that yeah. right? So, yeah. so, so I'm often, I'm also interested in these little cues that sometimes life sends us on a little journey. Like, <laughs> does living in a town called Winter make you feel more likely to succeed? 
Um, I think not if you've been to Winter. <laughs> which is, it's a lovely place. No yeah, yeah. Uh, offense. But it's really, really, I think it's like a thousand people. It's really small. Yeah. There's not a lot in Winter. I thoroughly, um, yeah, I, I love the name. I think, no. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> Perhaps Just, maybe subconsciously somewhere, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's That's a very funny. unique little place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Going back to the question of identity, I saw a talk that you gave mm -hmm. that was speaking about this question of self. And mm -hmm. you mentioned that it was interesting to me and, and maybe should have been more intuitive, but there, I think you said there was no I in traditional Lakota culture. And there was a sort of greater sort of sense of community in your place within something else. And I'm wondering if that's something that as you became more in touch with that part of your heritage and culture, whether that's something you just continued to lean in more, or is that something where you talk also about sort of being very good at code switching and being a bridge and, and things like that. But obviously in, in sort of the more Western American culture, it's very individualistic. And I'm wondering about what that tension was like or how you dealt with those two pieces of, uh, of identity. Yeah. And actually, I would say for me, it's several pieces of identity because yes, the like Lakotas traditionally could not, you can't define yourself as an individual by yourself. You can only define yourself as a person in relationship to others. Mm. Also, though, I would say Midwestern culture that I grew up in is very group centered, <laughs> community mm. focused. Yeah. I mean, I tell people all the time, I joke, but you know, South Dakota, like everything here can kill you, like the weather, the environment, the animals, the plants, you know, you name it, something <laughs> can kill you. So we really just count on each other. You have to mm. count on your neighbors just to stay alive yeah. and help each other out of snowbanks because people die in snowbanks every year, yeah. you know? So all the things that are part of Midwestern culture, even white culture as well, are very much about community. And then I would say also, you know, Christian culture, right? My parents uh, brought me up in, in the church and, and they were in a non-denominational church they'd helped create. And it was all about the group and the we and serving. And mm. I'd say all three of those things really um, worked hard to make me endlessly, um, maybe too aware of community and others in a way that, um, and my responsibility to community and, and always being part of community. It is hard, you know, to this, I will say having this plan Broadway I had to, for the first, I had to, I didn't have to, but honestly, for my own sanity, I had to get a PR firm for the first time, mm. someone to handle the press. And Jeremy is on the phone with us right now because <laughs> that's part of my PR team, right? And so I did that and it was really, really hard for me because I really struggle with these things that you and I are doing right now, yeah. talking about myself and talking about this journey because it feels like it's centering myself in a way that I'm mm. very uncomfortable with what I had to get past with other native folks helping me was like, yeah, but this is the first, you know, this is the first time we've had native American female playwright in the history of Broadway. It's yeah. like the second native playwright we've had in the entire history of Broadway. The last one was you know, 80 years ago. So like we need, people need to know that people need to hear that it's a, they need to hear the loss and they need to hear it's happened and being able to say, from my heart, because of those people, we did it. Like we're on Broadway. Yeah. It's not just me. It's it's Native people are on Broadway and Native women are on Broadway. Is incredibly important um, to our community and to people to know that and understand that. And so that's the only way I can do this, right? Yeah. Is to say, okay, I'm doing it for everybody. Otherwise, I wouldn't have hired a PR group and we would not be speaking because <laughs> <Yeah. Well, yeah. laughs> I would just be hiding in my little cabin over here in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, to go back to something you said before, I did notice that in the in the little playbill sort of bios that they put in there that you mentioned Lynn Riggs, who's mm -hmm. the previous Native American to have a show on Broadway. And I did not know that it was his show that was the inspiration for Oklahoma, which uh, again, I just, I think that the discovery of history is such a wonderful thing to do. I mean, the good, the bad, and even the ugly, because it sort of just enhances our appreciation of, of, of the world, which your your current play, which we'll talk about in a bit, really, really gets into. Mm -hmm. But I also want to talk a little bit about the necessity of, we talked a little bit about our own stories and our own identity, and they are sometimes very individualistic, but they're part of a, mm -hmm. of a broader sort of cloth that's woven, right? And I was really moved by a statement that you made that, he was in the context of a talk that was, I think, speaking about the importance of the work in general. Mm -hmm. And you said, we are not what is left. We are not the broken. We are the dreams our ancestors had for us. 
And I just thought that was so powerful because it was really speaking maybe against a very sort of deficit-based way in which people sometimes appreciate or think about uh, Native American culture. And I'm just wondering if you can describe a little bit more about that sentiment in the context of why your your work is probably as important as it is. Yeah, you know, I, I definitely reject that kind of, like you said, deficit-based yeah. view of our culture. You know, people always want to make us like the last and the sad and the... Yeah. Yeah. The survivors. And it's like, no, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're the survivors. I mean, if you think about it, the, you know, quote unquote, greatest nation in the world has been trying to annihilate us for hundreds of years, centuries. Mm. We're still here. I mean, that's pretty incredible. I mean, what the heck? Who are those people? You know, right, like, right. that's amazing. Um, and I'm one of them. So I'm pretty darn proud of that. I, I think we have endless, endless resilience and endless gifts. It's funny, people talk a lot, and I've done some work on intergenerational trauma and, mm. and what we've inherited. But you know, the, the these women I've been working with are like, yeah, but inherited intergenerational resilience and strength mm. and power and, and gifts and talent. Like, that's the reason we're here. You know, like, if, if you inherited more strength than trauma. Mm. And considering the genocide we've been undergoing and continue to undergo, for centuries, that's an incredible amount of resilience and strength and talent that we've inherited. And um, so I, I choose to focus on that. I am in uh, uh, looking at why I know a lot of your, your work and, and such. It's been about you know, why, why different people, why yeah. you know, you're where you are and I'm where I am and all those things. Um, you know, I, I definitely have always been someone who's focused on the positive, you know, focused on the uplifting. I, I certainly could focus on a lot of the negatives and the traumas. And I did grow up fairly poor. I, I didn't realize, I think similar, I didn't realize I was poor. I've been talking to friends here and I was like, oh, wow, okay. Target was too expensive for us. That's probably yeah. <laughs> yeah. fairly poor. <laughs> um, and so things like that, that, you know, I remember dreaming of buying something at Target and because that was fancy to me uh, yeah. and living off of thrift stores and, you know, all that. And, yeah, yeah, and making, yeah. but then I made it a choice. I was like, great, if I'm going to live off thrift stores, I'm going to wear really cool vintage clothes and, and have my own style and all of those things. So I, for whatever reason, and I'm not sure that when we haven't figured out my therapy yet, <laughs> I do focus <laughs> on the positive and on yeah. and that, and that story of our native people. Yeah. Well, it is, you know, it's interesting because like you can live and grow up and I, I've had this conversation with other people be before who they may have lived in poor circumstances, but they didn't feel that way. Because yep. there's something within their community where they 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 appreciated or understood the abundance and other things, uh, and yet there's other times, and our culture can do this. There's meanness that runs throughout. Where you mentioned, you know, Target being too expensive. I remember that I'd see kids with an IZOD on their shirt with an alligator, mm -hmm. but I'd have the rabbit. <laughs> like, what, yeah. you know, and, and at first I thought the rat, I didn't know that the rabbit wasn't cool or whatever until someone made me feel bad about it, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and I do wonder to the extent to which the story, like your work seems to be serving a role, an important role, both inside and outside of your culture. Right. And so mm -hmm. I'm just curious to know a lot of those deficit stories you were talking before, are, do they seep into the culture and the mindset of Native Americans is on the contrary, when you said someone reminded you, like you've got, you know, hundreds of years of, of resilience built into you. Is that mm -hmm. like how, what's the process inside the culture like in terms of how that story is getting played out or seeping in? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, there's hundreds of Native cultures right, around this right, continent, right, right, so I can't right. speak to them all. I will say, you know, here in my, I'm sitting here um, on the lands of my people, though, Chetty Shakawi, I would, I'm in Black Hill, South Dakota right now, and we're working on a play with Native Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota people that's going to tour the state to many reservations that we've been talking to for the past five years about, you know, what is it? What is it mm. that you want people to know about you? What is it that you're struggling with? What are your challenges? What are your successes, et cetera? I will say it's really, I was pleasantly surprised. So if you're in the outside of Lakota culture, I would say in general mainstream American culture, you either see one of two things. You see a romanticized Hollywood version of us, you know, because we are the big eagle feather headdress, mm -hmm. teepee, crazy horse, sitting bull, red, I mean, uh, um, all those folks, red cloud. And you know, we are those people. Or you see the endless poverty porn, right? And the mm. constant, because, you know, we do have, like, I think our reservations have like six of the poorest counties in the mm. 
mm. nation, you know, so there, there's, I mean, poverty is intense here and our, you know, and that's on purpose, right? We were being punished for continuing to fight against the government right until the end, right? And mm. until the very end of the 19th century. And so we were being, we were severely punished by the government for that. We were prisoners of war. And so that was all intentional and, and to try to get, get rid of us and punish us for our resistance and our successful resistance, incredibly successful. So that being said, you know, when we started talking to people quite a few years ago with this play with Cornerstone Theater Company and saying, you know, what is it? What do you want people to know? Like nobody talked about poverty. No one talked about, mm. it was just wild. Like people talked about specific issues you know meth has been a has hit south dakota yeah. really hard in the in general in the last few years and definitely our reservations we see we get things late in south dakota <laughs> so we got meth about 10 years later than everybody else but it's it's really bad so that we heard about but most we heard about people just talking about regular life stuff yeah. raising their kids figuring out how to raise them and what school they're going to go to and you know there's a lot of that and so much of it was about culture and again like how our culture makes us resilient and how the answers are in our culture and how we need to get back to those things and so what actually emerged from the vast majority of talks i had with people here was um the idea of lakota superheroes because they feel like our ancestors by living in our ways were superheroes and had these like mm -hmm. incredible powers that we can have again and so that's what this play is about it's about just reclaiming who we are which which is because we are superheroes again right we've yeah. survived the biggest baddest villain and who continues to hunt us and we're still here and so we are superheroes and and, and so i was really excited and surprised how much of that has gotten through and continues to be present in our culture. Certainly, you know, the effects of that, that being hunted for so long by this government is there and the effects of meth and the effects of, you know, so many other of poverty and, and um, a lack of a good food system, you know, all those things are, are plaguing us and, and continue to kill off a lot of our people. But I was shocked at how much the talks were about superpowers. You know, that's yeah. pretty exciting. That's great. I wonder if there's also something about the process that you set up that sort of also allowed more of that to come out because I was in reading about it, this, because I was, I was talking to someone else talking about inclusive community sort of initiatives. Mm -hmm. And then they were talking about something that was like, sounded very inclusive. And then I told them about your effort with this specific play where I think they actually, you're, you're reviewing scripts, you're getting ideas, and then they have veto over every word, I think is what I heard, right? Yep. Which is, and, and they were like blown away. And it was like, well, yeah, it's their story. So I guess that would probably mm -hmm. make sense, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but yet I still found that sort of wonderful example that I imagine even going through that process would make people feel resilient and like superheroes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And it, it takes time. Like that's why these processes, they take a long time because it takes a while for people to believe us, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because artists come in here all the time saying, I wanna work with the community. And really, they just want to center themselves. They want to do what they want to do. They want the community yeah. to like support them in doing it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they yeah. want yeah. to, you know, extract something for themselves and go away and do it. Yeah. And it takes a long time to get people to believe us that, you know, we honestly, my partner, Michael John Garcess and I are honestly just want to do whatever it is you want to do. And if you know, we've said that if in the end you say you want to have a massive dinner that travels around the state and we cook and serve food, that's what we'll do. Like, yeah. we have no <laughs> stake in making this into something. I will say though, also, Michael and I are both incredibly privileged as artists, right? Mm. So we get the biggest stages in the country. You know, our next play together is at the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles, right? Mm. So we get to work that way. So our ego gets to be filled, you know, artistic yeah. ego and, and desires get to be filled elsewhere so that we can put all that aside and say, we're just here to serve community and uplift community. And to be honest, I mean, we get 10 times more back from this process than we do yeah. from anything else, you know, yeah. but yeah. it is really a privilege to be able to do what we do to put our egos aside and our artistic desires and say, what is it you want? What can we do? How can we uplift the community and help you tell your stories in your ways? And it takes a while to get people to trust it. But once you do it, it's amazing. And to give that veto power, it's hard. I mean, it's really hard because we to give yeah. it even to community members. So if we're performing and a community member comes and says, you know what, that's not right. You didn't do this right you need to change this, then we change it. And and that yeah. takes time and which means money because we pay everybody. All our community members are being paid a good, good salary and they're all being fed and housed and all the things. So we have to really plan for that and yeah. be ready to do it. 
Yeah, but I imagine it's worth itself like a hundred times over. Because not only are yeah. you happy with what the resulting player experiences, you're just happy about the entire process that led to it, right? Yeah, we were talking, we set our first circle here on Monday. And I said, you know, this is the work that I know, because I've seen it firsthand, actually saves lives. And yeah. theater, we want to say, we're that important. And do we need Broadway? I don't know. But actually, I think we do. <laughs> you know, I do think we do. But this is the place on the ground here doing these plays, where yeah. I can see it one on one. Like I've seen young people whose lives have been saved by working with us and getting, not just us, but getting, working together with other people and feeling a part of something and expressing themselves and being seen and heard in a mm. way that they didn't think was possible and caused them to not take their own life, for instance. And wow. that's pretty incredible. And, and, and that we get to see one-on-one -on -one here. I suspect that happens in theaters all the time, right? We hear about people yeah. like, you know, this play saved my life. We just don't get to see it because they're sitting in the dark over there. But here I get to see it one-on-one -on -one and see how art actually can save lives. I just want to take a few moments to thank our partner. Attribution is distributed in part by Chasing the Dream, a public media initiative from the WNET Group reporting on poverty, justice, and economic opportunity in America. You can learn more at pbs.org slash chasing the dream. Now back to the show. So there's another element to, to the work, right, which is outside of the community. So the stories that you want the, the rest of us to hear and appreciate that sort of get away from some of the sort of stereotypical things we were talking about earlier. And, you know, as a country, we obviously don't have a really good grasp of our history mm -hmm. and don't deal with contentious topics really well. Yeah. And people fall into one camp where either they want to deny it and they just American exceptionalism or they contort themselves in terms of something that may be considered sort of performative in terms of trying to be politically correct or culturally sensitive. And it seems like you're threading the needle a little bit on some of that with the work. There was something I saw in a different play where I think it was, you were giving out certificates of reduced guilt. Yeah. Which I just thought was a, <laughs> was such a wonderful and charming idea. Because it wasn't like to absolve yourself from what you may be associated with, but it's mm -hmm. like, hey, it's not necessarily all on you. I assume that's what the premise was, yeah. but I was wondering if you just sort of talk about what that, what that, <laughs> that little conceit or practice was. Yeah, that was in our my first play at Cornerstone, Urban Rose, and we had certificates of reduced guilt that you could get. You had to there was like a list of things you could do that gave you different amounts. To be honest, if you did all of them, you only got two percent reduction in your guilt, which is you know better than nothing. But you know you had to like learn a word in the language of uh, the tongues of people, which is where we were performing, mm. or you had to listen to an elder story, or you you know there's a lot of things you had to do. Yeah. You could give all the land back and that still only gets you to 50%, but hey, we'll take it because yeah. um, there's a lot of baggage we got to deal with, but we'll take it. So I think you know, when you said threading the needle, for sure, right? I'm, I'm definitely threading a lot of needles here because the reality is the majority of theater is a white audience, right? Mm. Uh, that's just where we still are. That's the world I have inherited and have stepped into. And so I'm, again, being a very optimistic person, I'm like, okay, what can I do? How can I affect this world? And we, we don't know history. I mean, we're just shockingly ill-educated, right? We just don't yeah. understand anything about the land we're standing on. And so figuring out how I can find a place in this world I've inherited, which is predominantly white institutions that call themselves theaters, has been then me saying, okay, well, what, what can I do? How can I balance me being mm -hmm. part of a we? and being part of a we on the native side, but also probably part of a we on now, honestly, on the theater side, right? And being yeah. a theater practitioner who is quite very privileged, right? I'm one of the very privileged playwrights in this country. So how do I balance those things? And what can I, where can I serve the most people in the best way? And my goal always is, right? So bring indigenous peoples, bring other people with me, bring other ideas, open people's minds, make them think, make them question, but then also continue to do you know, whatever is a, considered a good job so that I get to keep doing this work and get, get to keep bringing people with me. So it's, yeah. it, it's the constant balance, right? I, or I have, you know, have to. I'm actually yeah. very much enjoying talking to you, but I have to do these things, right? I have to <laughs> yeah, yeah. press and do these things so that my plays continue to get produced. So I continue to have that privilege. So I can continue to bring other writers and other stories and people with me and continue to be able to raise the incredible amount of money we had to raise to do this play out here in South Dakota, which yeah. 
is very much because of my privilege in white theater. Right. When we think about the way in which we try to introduce history in a way that feels palatable or that mm -hmm. people are going to stay open to, right? It reminds me of a story years ago. I was having a conversation with Natasha Trethewey, who is a former U.S. Poet Laureate. And she had written this wonderful book called Memorial Drive. And a lot mm -hmm. of it is her trying to also come to terms with some of the cultural issues she was dealing with down in the South, you know, and Stone Mountain and things along those lines that she had mm -hmm. to drive by every day. And I'd, I'd shared with her a story that I had just discovered about my own sort of situation, which was that I had for years gone around feeling so proud about having been able to attend college, being the first in my family, and specifically because I went to a land grant college. Mm -hmm. You know, and the land grant, and what I knew at the time of land grant colleges were essentially they were set up to make college more accessible to people who weren't of a high class, right? And so my story I was telling myself for most of my life was, hey, this is this wonderful thing that my country did to provide opportunities for kids who didn't have a lot like me. And then one day I decided to learn a little bit more about land grants. And I'd never questioned like how they actually worked. And I discovered that <laughs> land had been taken from Native Americans in Arizona and New Mexico. And then they would so it was given to different states that they would sell in order to create endowments for universities like the one I attended to. And it sort of rocked me for a bit, right? Like, oh man, this is the opposite of the way I used to feel about this. But when I spoke to Natasha about it, she said, uh, she goes, yeah, but isn't it wonderful that you know that now? And mm -hmm. wonder in the truest sense of it, like wonder and you feel awe and you feel small. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, that's a really interesting way in which like now I can make sense of that. And I tell that story all the time. So mm -hmm. people who also maybe right. went to land grant colleges didn't, you know, can, can know that not to make them feel guilty, but to just make them feel connected to the story of their country and to other people who maybe they thought was this distant kind of peoples who they didn't do anything quote to, you know? Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm surprised how much land grant comes up now in my life. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I didn't know either. Cause I didn't go to college. I didn't know college. Yeah, things, yeah. But I was like, Ooh, wow. Yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> so that's one way of like, you know, this sort of trying to find ways in which people can connect to their history on a more personal level. Again, even things that may make them feel uh, more uncomfortable. And I, I want to sort of turn, now to the Thanksgiving play, which sort of so deftly uses satire as a way to introduce history and to get us thinking and laughing and then even thinking about whether we should be laughing. And I'm, I'm wondering, I, I heard the origin of why you went this way, but it might be helpful for others to hear because there, it seemed like it was a, there was a large casting consideration. Yeah, I originally created this play because of my endless frustration. I've been writing plays for about a dozen years and doing well and getting a lot of commissions. And But my commissions were only getting produced by the original theater, meaning for folks who aren't familiar with how that works, a theater pays me a chunk of money as an investment to write a play for them. And then they hopefully produce it. I was very fortunate. I was getting about 80% production rate, which is fairly high, it turns out. You know? But then after that, you know, I still own the play no one else was producing my plays. And and that's where you make your money, right? Is that mm. people license it and they keep doing it. And and so I wasn't getting any money past that initial production. And we started figuring, asking why. And the number one reason I got was casting. That was impossible. My plays were called uncastable because, you know, one had one half Native American character in it and um, yeah. others had more. And people just said they couldn't do that. Well, I knew that was ridiculous. But there we were. I'm not in the position to change that <laughs> and so and i decided well i'm gonna give myself the challenge of writing this play that is four white presenting people in one room and if american theater says they can't produce that then obviously we have something else to talk about because that means we're talking about either my writing or the issues that i'm writing about in the play and the issues are all contemporary indigenous issues so thanksgiving play started from that that was the challenge fortunately i love the play it did everything I wanted to do. It is a satire, as you said, but I also say, always say very importantly, it's a comedy in a satire. And I think that's what, you know, you were talking about earlier, right? Of how we choose to tell these things. So we are telling some accurate truths about history. And it's fascinating. Some people are like, oh, you know, 
how are you going to tell this? What are you going to do? How are you going to tell? I'm like, I'm just going to literally state the facts. Like, that's mm. all I'm going to do. And people are like, oh, it's shocking. It's too much. It's too far. It's like, I'm just stating the facts. <laughs> As mm. the pilgrims wrote it down themselves in their right. own little books, they were very, they wrote down everything they did. So I just am telling you the facts of what they said they did. And that's considered shocking and too much and all these things. It's like, wow, we can't just say the facts. But then within that, right, there is the satire of doing a play about Native people without native people and then inside of all that there's this comedy right so yeah. because i do want it to be fun like i want us to go forward like guilt is it's it's, it's mobilizing right it, mm. it doesn't do anything useful it doesn't push you forward it, it tends to be something that you just wallow we talk about wallowing in it right you know yeah. and so we need to get past guilt we need to get to understanding recognition I don't know, so many things, responsibility. You were talking about the land grants, right? We need to understand that we are culpable. Yeah. And so I want all of that to come across. But then I also want people to not just feel like bashed over the head. Like now I, I can't, I'm so battered yeah. and hurt that I can't move forward. We need to move forward together. I mean, there's gazillions more non-native people than there are native people on this continent for all our resilience. And so we need a lot of people to help us and to stay with us and to let us continue to thrive and continue to be resilient in the next many centuries. And so to get all those allies and all those supporters, I I bring them with me through my plays, through comedy. And that's what the comedy is yeah. for, is to say here, have fun too. Like we need yeah. to move forward together, not separately. I saw something that you had said that characterized one of the intentions of the play was around this idea of making mistakes together. Yeah. This this notion of that sometimes we can be so paralyzed to make a mistake in what we say or what we do that we just tie ourselves in knots and then there's nothing that comes from it. And at least if we're creating some space where we can make mistakes together, you're moving mm -hmm. past them in some way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I see that all the time, right? Because I work in theater, which is primarily a more liberal, well-meaning group of folk. And I do believe they mean well. I do, <laughs> mostly. Yeah. Um, but they're so afraid of making a mistake. The number of times I've been in a theater and one Native person has like, complained about something, right? And they send the complaint to me, the playwright. And I'm like, mm. Why are you sending this to me? I have no white people complained about anything you've ever done. They're like, oh, we get endless <laughs> complaint letters all the time. I'm like, do you right. send them all those endless complaint letters to your white playwrights? They're like, well, well. And I'm like, yeah, so suck it up. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. people are going to be mad. <laughs> like, no, no one, is, you know, we're not a monolith. Some, a patron's upset. It's your job to then go talk to that patron and find out why they're upset and what, whatever you do with any other patron. It's not my job it's just because I'm the native person in the room and that, but they're so afraid of making a mistake with that person that they yeah. just like pass it off to me, which is wild. Something they would never do to a white playwright. Never. Right, right. They're so, you know, protect the playwright. And, and it's like, Oh, protect me. <laughs> I'm, I'm your, you know, <laughs> playwright too. But it's wild how often that happens. And because they're so terrified of making a mistake. And I always right. tell people when we start working on a new play as a theater that hasn't worked with a native playwright, native topics before, I say, I guarantee you, I promise you, someone will be mad. Because that's just humans, right? Yeah, Someone's always yeah. mad, no matter what you do. I promise you a native person will also be mad. <laughs> like, I can guarantee that. Because a white person's always mad, and a black person's always mad, and an Asian person, you know, like, someone's always mad. Yeah. So someone's going to be mad, and that's part of what we do. You know, I, I write pretty provocative theater. You know, I don't write feel-good, happy theater, innocuous theater. I write theater that makes you think, and someone's going to be mad. And one of them will be a native person, I guarantee it. And yeah. uh, you're going to have to figure that out. Yeah. Well, the other thing too, I mean, actually yeah, after <laughs> reading the, the quote about mistakes, it made me go back and I just wanted to, I wanted to clarify the definition of a mistake because <laughs> I wanted to, I was just curious. Mm. And, and, Ooh, and so, yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's a wrong action or statement proceeding from faulty judgment, inadequate knowledge and inattention. And then in sort of breaking Ooh, that wow. down, I thought like, I thought, geez, as a, as a people and as a culture, we are ripe with bad judgment we have all kinds of inadequate knowledge and we don't pay attention to anything. And so it's like, how would we not go yeah, through right? life making all these mistakes? <laughs> and so to me, it was really interesting wow, because yeah. we, we don't like, uh, again, there is this pressure to not make a mistake. And then in order to avoid that mistake, mm -hmm. we prefer to sit on the sidelines or not talk about something or not to go someplace with a question or a discussion. And it seems like it just does such a, a huge disservice 
Yeah, right. Well, and like, you know, we were talking, you were said earlier, exceptionalism, right? We're supposed to know the answer. Like somehow that makes you the better person because you're the one that has the answer. I, I will say what makes me successful as an artist is making endless mistakes and not having any answers, right? Mm. I would say my, you know, when I talked to writers about writing and they were like, I can't get through the first draft. I was like, so my, this is the gift that was given to me when I started writing, was that your first draft, your goal is to write a really bad draft. And I was <laughs> like, I promise you can write a bad play. I guarantee yeah. it. I, I write many, many bad plays. That's my goal. So my first draft, my goal is to write a bad play. And if you start with that goal, then you'll get something. Like I can do that. Yeah. I can achieve that. And then I can fix it. Yeah. As opposed to thinking that like, I think we have this thought in our head that good writers like set out and write something good. You know, it's yeah. like, no, I don't. I write something really crappy. It's terrible. And then I fix it. And that's the work, right? Is to fix it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like all things are iterative in some level, right? And you hope that you're sort of constantly looking to improve upon them. And yet, it, se it seems, in especially increasingly these days, that it's just really hard to allow for that, yeah. to create the space where, hey, you know, you, you goofed, I didn't, you know, hey, you're a good guy, I didn't hold it against you, you, made, you said something that was wrong, now you learn mm -hmm. from it and, and move on. So I, th I think that's really sort of interesting. I, I do wonder, I was curious to note the responses that you've gotten from different groups of people. I was sitting there in the audience and I'm mm -hmm. listening to people I mean, like, you know, there's laughing and cringing and things that are going on because you see yeah. certain things that you just know are beyond the pale, but at the same time, you may recognize some of that within yourself or within people you know. And I'm wondering the response, like whether some people miss the whole point, whether some people get upset by certain things. I'm just wondering, which I, th which I think all those kinds of reactions are on one level probably good, but I'm just wondering what what you've seen in terms of the reaction to what people give you afterwards or that you've heard separately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's all over the map for sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. In the room, it's an incredible time, right? When you're in that yeah. space, it's wild and raucous and crazy. Yeah. Reviewers are like a hundred percent down the middle split for me. They love it. They get it. It's genius. It's horrible. It's direct. It's over. It's awful. You know, there's just, yeah. there's no in between, <laughs> which is I'm fine <laughs> with. No one's like, eh, it's all right. And I'm totally good with that. Yeah. You know, I, I don't read reviews, but I, you know, just knowing from what my people tell me and whatever, you know, I, it is, it's, you love it or you hate it. There's not a lot yeah. in between. And that's great. I love that. That makes me really happy. They know like I've gotten in there. Even if you hate it, yeah. I know I've gotten into your brain and I'm making things happen that you're unhappy about right. and you're uncomfortable with. That makes, that thrills me. And so, yeah, there's that. I will say definitely, you know, there's very different reactions. There's a scene in there where we depict actual, again, history written down by pilgrims mm -hmm. uh, pretty graphically. And interestingly, at least when I've been there for the first 20 some performances, the only people I saw walk out were older white men. And mm. they were really mad, really mad, <laughs> and mm. like furious and let everybody know how furious they were about a depiction of something that happened in history that white folks yeah. did. And yeah. that was interesting to me. And I was like, oh, because they, they couldn't just leave. They had to leave and like make a big statement about right, leaving. Right, right, right. And I was like, huh, fascinating. One gentleman like dragged his wife out. He reluctantly, he clearly didn't want to go. And I watched them have this whole like argument. And then finally she felt like she had to go because he's making a scene and causing an uproar yeah. around them. So she finally left. That was interesting. I think, you know, people react very differently. You know, there's certainly, you know, my intern was from Columbia. She's from a graduate program there. And she's a young woman of color. And she's like, yeah, some of my class classmates are really mad because you wrote a play of all white people. I was like, totally get that. Valid. <laughs> right. Me, I was mad too. <laughs> like, yeah. Hundred percent down, and yet I know that that's the price I paid. And now I have five more plays this year that are all native right. cats. I yeah. could not crack that before this. Yeah. Other writers have. Yeah. Well, I thought it was interesting about that, especially because I understand that the play's been uh, performed a bunch around the country already, right? And hopefully yeah. even more so. What I thought was interesting is there's sort of a meta moment where they're grappling with the exact same question inside the play. Right. Yeah. In terms of like, yeah. how do they cast it? And again, to, to the point of like most communities, I shouldn't say most, I'm going to guess many mm -hmm. communities in, in America, maybe wouldn't have the ability to cast a play about Thanksgiving mm -hmm. that was representative. And so that is maybe a challenge that they would have. And so do you not do anything? Do you, what do you mm -hmm. do? And, 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 and I know that probably would be a question that some would have. And, but again, the point of grappling with the question I think is the right. important thing, right? You know, is not to ignore yeah. it, not to avoid doing something. It's like, well, what do you do in this situation? What does it say? Mm -hmm. And 
I guess that's one of the things I was left struggling with and questioning in the conversation I had with my wife and people afterwards was that at the end, there is this sort of sense that they are just tying themselves in knots the entire time trying to figure out how to put this play on. And mm -hmm. I, I don't want to give a spoiler alert here, but but <laughs> but the resolution at the end is still, I guess you can say it's either completely resolved or not resolved at all, right? Mm -hmm. Depending upon how yeah. you see what they come up with. And I was just wondering whether that was an intentional statement on what does happen sometimes, which is we don't do anything, mm -hmm. or whether mm -hmm. it was some kind of uh, performative seeding of space. It was just, it was wondering what mm -hmm. your intention was in terms of the yeah. very end, in terms of how people think about how those four characters resolve that. And the fact that even after they sort of resolve how to deal with that play, they still want to go and do something else that is still <laughs> right. ridiculous. Yes, they do. Yeah, I think I'll be honest, I don't have like one way I inter interpret the ending and different yeah. directors have done it different ways. Yeah. Uh, so for instance, Rachel Chavkin, who directed this production that you're talking about, she talks about it as the snake eating its own tail, right? So it's just mm. this endless like yeah. circle of, of self-destruction that just can't finish. And I think that's hopefully fairly obvious from this ending, although people do see it differently. I think also the idea of so the, the the character Jackson, who is the main male character in this play, is interesting. One of the actors said they were really upset because one of their white friends came and thought, oh, they interpret the ending as something really positive and good for them, and that they could it gives them permission not to do anything. I was like, well, you know what? If you spent ninety minutes with this clearly mm. way off base misogynist. And yeah. now you're saying that that's the person you're going to trust. Like <laughs> his choice was the right one at the end. Yeah. I can't help you. <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> there's, yeah. I, I just, there's nothing I can do. I'm just a yeah. dramatist. Like I, I can't, if you think that guy is the guy you want to follow after he's been so offensive and so ridiculous yeah. for 90 minutes, peace to you. I, I can't, yeah. I can't help. <laughs> yeah. So there's like so much I can do. <laughs> Although he is a vegan ally, right? He is a vegan ally, which is nice. I consider yeah, myself a I, vegan ally. Yeah, yeah. I do wonder like how, so there's definitely this aspect of poking a lot of fun at what some people would see as performative and yet well-intentioned. And we talked about the aspect that it does get in the way of progress because you spend so much time sort of in, in that. But then I just do, I also wonder like how you think about that when you see it like not in the mm -hmm. stage, but in life where people are trying to do it. And so, I mean, I think on one hand, I've seen land, land acknowledgements that have been done that seem very, very thoughtful. Mm -hmm. And then some where people literally just used an app to see what they should say, right? That I wonder about, well, is that the real intention? I'm not sure. And I, I wonder how you draw the line or interpret the actions. Like, is it good that someone's trying anything? Or it's like, when does it go so far over the top that it's sort of Again, stymieing progress or investing energy on things that aren't aren't, aren't as helpful. Yeah, I mean, that's, there's so many answers to that, right? Because it depends yeah. on the person, on the moment, on where they are, and what their actions, what their abilities, what their capacities. I mean, you know, like taking your example of land acknowledgement. You know, I was just in discussions with it's pretty wild the theater company I'm working with later this year, and they got to like they did this whole thing where they had a land acknowledgement, then it said it wasn't enough, and there wasn't any follow up, and so it become was it going to be wrote? Oh, and so they went round and round and round. And ultimately what they came up with was they're going to do nothing. Like they have no land acknowledgement <laughs> and do nothing. And it's like, okay, that's not the, <laughs> clearly you haven't read my play. That's yeah. not an option. I just wrote back. I was like, so this is not an option. I need you to figure something else out. But that's yeah. the thing, right? Like I need them to figure something else out. So yeah. if you're saying, honestly, we've been doing this land acknowledgement too long. We need to do something else. Well, then do something else. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Do more because land acknowledgement is just a step, right? Yeah. I will say, though, I think in our field, we can get a little like, oh, we've heard land acknowledgement too much. It's so rote. However, I can walk out this door and, well, maybe not in South Dakota, but in most places in the country and find 20 people on the street that have no idea whose land they're standing on, yeah. right? Yeah. So until we have that base knowledge, we can't yeah. get very far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah, you can't yeah. pay reparations to someone if you've never heard of them. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. So we have to start somewhere. Yeah. Or the other way to look at it is uh is like we don't 
grow tired of singing the national anthem at a baseball game or hear it song. You know what I mean? Like right? there are certain things that we do with repetition that we accept, even though it's repetitious, right? Yeah, but for sure. it's repetitious because you're trying to sort of underscore something that's important in culture. Yeah, I know Ooh, we're coming up on example. time, so. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and use it as as, as, as you like. Um, I will. Yeah, we're coming up on time, but I do, I wanted to ask mm -hmm. one question and then a final sort of thought. And so mm -hmm. this idea of making progress, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's through art or through plays, or I know you've got an, another initiative where you work with organizations who are trying to sort this out. Mm -hmm. One one example I read was with uh, with Macy's and their Thanksgiving Day Parade, yeah, which I thought was really interesting to hear because they they were. You know, some may see them as really progressive changes they made in terms of the play, or they were small steps. But either way, they were sort of steps in important conversations. And and I think sometimes we can let the perfect get is the enemy of progress, right? And I'm just wondering mm -hmm. how you think about sort of the progress of your work and what success looks like for you. Ooh, yeah, that's a good question. Especially now, I'm kind of in a place where I'm like, I don't know. I had the goal of being on Broadway for a long time. I'll be 100% honest because it was something that had, was basically considered unattainable by a Native American yeah. playwright when I got into this business um, because it had been the beginning of the last century before we'd had one. And yeah. so it was really important to me to do that. And I was already in a position early in my career where, you know, I started with more theaters. I didn't start in like the college circuit or downtown theaters. I started with big regional theaters. And so I was like, mm -hmm. well, I'm in a position to do this. Like I'm on that trajectory from the very beginning. And so I really worked hard for it. So I, for me, I will say personally, just on a personal note, I'm very like, now what? I don't know. I'm not sure <laughs> what I'm doing next. I have a lot of opportunities, a yeah. lot of interest in what I do, fortunately, because of the reach that Broadway has. I have a lot of plays still that I have to get done this year and a couple more that are on the dock for next year. So I have like seven, eight plays in a row that are ready to wow. go. So that's, you know, to be done. But I think success to me, I think I can't help it. I, and it sounds really, it sounds like I'm just making stuff up, but I really do believe success to me believe, means a community. Like I would have a community. Yeah. Success to me means that I would have a community of indigenous writers in theater that are on Broadway, that are in the regional theaters, that are doing the national tours, that are, you know, doing all the things that I can be a part of because I've never yeah. been able to do that. You know, I have the one or two, you know, playwrights that are being produced around the country now. This year I think it's like five. That's pretty exciting. Wow. Native playwrights. Yeah. That's that's more than I have ever been in my career. Still didn't have anyone I could talk to on Broadway. I still didn't have a coalition yeah. of you know, Native American producers to support me. I don't have anything like that. And so I, I hope that I can be a part of building that for other playwrights and then also for myself. I'd love to be yeah. a part of a group in my theater field. I am a part of a group in my Native community. And so many incredible Native community members came out to see the show and spend time. And we got to say, yay, we made it. But <laughs> I would love to have that in my theater community as well. And, and it is growing, but I, I'd like it to be, you know, 10 times bigger, 10 times faster. Yeah. It's nice when you can say like people like me do things like this and you can find each other easily, right? Mm -hmm. It's a great source of inspiration. I'm lying to you. I said I was going to ask one more question, but you just said something. Yeah. I just want a quick, a quick sure. follow up. Sure. I said this earlier and I almost caught myself, but you so politely did it for me, which was uh, mm -hmm. I'm not lumping in the entirety of Native America when I ask you this question. I'm just, you know, you're not in a monolith. <laughs> but I am curious in terms of you, you just said a, several members of your community have seen the play. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering what their response has been yeah the people i've been with obviously they're talking to me so they're really nice who knows what they're saying yeah, elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but you know they're just really excited so this one yeah. uh, actor is actually in the other room right now here in south he's with me in south dakota kenny ramos he's an indigenous actor from southern california that i've worked with several times at cornerstone and other places as well and he flew out from california to see the play 18 hours in new york and he stayed on my couch overnight and it was really such an important one because all the you know mm. i don't have a broadway native american coalition i don't have broadway yeah. producers i don't have famous broadway people a bunch of famous broadway producers coming they're native to support my play and i don't have any of those things but then i had kenny and i together jumping literally jumping up and down going <laughs> Yay, we did it we did it because we did it right yeah. we're on broadway and it, and it was such a beautiful thing that happened again and again with native folks that were like you know, I get all these Instagram messages now from all because I'm not in New York. Uh, you know, we made it. We made it. And they yeah. always say we. 
Yeah. And some of these people are people I barely know, but they're native people and because it is we, right? So yeah. we aren't a monolith, but also we made it. And yeah. and that's the most important thing for me is to have make sure that everyone feels that. Like that's because it is for everyone. It's not just for me. Obviously I'm here benefiting in so many ways, but the most important benefit is that it's for all of us as native people. That's great. So now I promise this is the last question. I end each show mm -hmm. with uh, sort of seeding the credits over to the guest. And so instead of there's Ooh. the casual, like music done by so-and-so and produced by, but mm -hmm. I also love to hear other people just acknowledge those who they're grateful for and who helped along the way. It's not intended to be a comprehensive exercise. Mm -hmm. So it's always good to, to, to couch that. Yeah. If someone's left out, don't take it personally. But I, I'm just wondering if there's a couple people you just wanted to take uh, the opportunity to acknowledge in terms of helping you on your journey so, thus far? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be here without all four of my parents, my birth parents and my adopted parents, my birth parents for having the wisdom to know they could not raise me and my adopted parents for doing an incredible job. I wouldn't be here without my husband, Ed Hogan, who said he's an artist too, but said, I will keep working my day job so that you don't have to and you can mm. just focus on writing. I would not be here without, honestly, my little teeny tiny team. So <laughs> unlike everybody else in the world, like who gets a Hollywood agent and whatever, I just have my one theater agent, Jonathan Mills, who's been with me from the very beginning and does every contract I have. And then my one attorney, Liza Montesano, and then now my PR, uh, well, the head of my PR team is um, Taylor James. There's just, it's just three. It's a big team of three. <laughs> and we do, and they do everything for me. And I'm, I'm very loyal that way. And I have people I trust. I'm with them to the end. And so, yeah, I'd say those are the most, the immediate ones. And then, uh, I, okay, also my partner, Michael John Garces, who's my artistic partner from over 12, 10 years that I'm working with here right now. We're doing three plays together this year. And without his incredible amount of work, picking up the slack while I was doing this Broadway whirlwind, I would not have been able to do it and continue to do all these plays this year. So very grateful to him as well. It's awesome. Yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah. Well, congratulations again on not just the success, but more importantly, perhaps all the work that you've done to, to get to this point and the work that you'll continue to do to create uh, incredibly thoughtful sort of plays in a community of people to tell the stories that we need to tell. So uh, thank you so much for, for taking the time thank to connect. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Attribution. This show was edited by Luke Robert Mason, music by Johnny Most Davis. Attribution is a production of the Moving Up Media Lab, whose mission is to inspire people to reflect on who and what has made their lives possible. To learn more and sign up for our weekly newsletter, please visit movingupusa.com. Today's final credit goes to you, the listener, and to everyone who helped you get to where you are today. If this show has reminded you of someone in particular, make their day and let them know.